Thank you so much, Ben. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, if you're still hanging in there with us, so appreciative, uh, especially those of you that have been with us for the last three days. Uh, I feel confident in saying that we have uh, put forth some amazing content, but as I've said a couple of times, uh, it, it, if, if no one's here, it's like that uh, proverbial tree falling in the woods. So uh, thank you for tuning in, and I'll remind you, if you like what you're seeing, uh, let us know. Uh, blast it out on Facebook, share it with your friends, um, and because we're not done yet, I'm really looking forward to this conversation, and then we have our keynote at five. Uh, we're really delighted to be hosting a conversation with Adrian Miller, the former literary editor of Esquire, who'll be speaking with Beth Ann Patrick, and then I'll have some final words after that. But without further ado, it is with extraordinary pleasure that I bring back my friend and personal hero, the rock star, Angie Kim. As Ben mentioned, Angie is a return guest. She was one of our keynote speakers last year, and I have to say we caught lightning in a bottle. I feel very fortunate that uh, I met Angie shortly before the release of her book, Miracle Creek, and uh, by the time the Lit Fest happened in July, she was already blowing up. So it was too late for her to back out, so she had to participate, and it was amazing. And of course, I've stayed in touch and followed the trajectory of her uh, a burgeoning career with great interest, and I asked her to come back, and she agreed, so I'm very happy. Let me introduce Angie. She is the debut author of the international bestseller and Edgar winner, Miracle Creek, which was named a Best Book of the Year by Time Magazine, The Washington Post, Kirkus, The Today Show, and others. A Korean immigrant, former editor of the Harvard Law Review, and one of Variety Mag Magazine's inaugural 10 Storytellers to Watch, Kim has written for Vogue, The New York Times Book Review, The Washington Post, Glamour, and numerous literary journals. She lives in Northern Virginia with her husband and three, I might add, very talented sons. By the way, she was too modest to include this in her updated bio that she sent me, but I will mention she's also the winner of the 2020 Thriller Award presented by International Thrillers. Angie, thank you for being here. It is my pleasure to speak with you. Welcome. Sean, thank you so much for that warm introduction. That's so awesome. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Yay. Well, I mean, so thank you for being back. Um, I think, oh, sounds like, let, let's let you adjust a little bit. It sounds like your volume needs to okay. be turned up a little bit. Okay. I hit the wrong button. Sorry about that. Oh, that's better. Um, okay. Um, that sounds great. A little bit bigger. Is that, is that better? That sounds great. Okay, great. I All can right. hear you now. Okay. Um, so let's get down to brass tacks and then we can dive in and get some questions from the audience. But like, take us, uh, I think people that, certainly people that don't know you or your work will, will and writers, aspiring writers, are gonna be so inspired by your story. But take us through the last 12 months because it's been, I, would, I, I think I called it a roller coaster, but it's a roller coaster that just keeps going up. No, it's, it's, I, I feel like it's a roller coaster on like a daily, hourly basis. Um, I was just telling Sean that I'm extremely uh, tense right now because I spent the entire day um, about an hour and a half away from my house dragging my, my son who's in high school to his first ACT and it ran extremely late, late and then there was like traffic coming back and mm. all this nonsense so therefore I have this nice glass of wine and yay. Um, cheers. Cheers. Cheers to 1465. Yay. Yay. Well, so let's, let's talk about this roller coaster. I know you're going to be too modest. Uh, I'm happy to brag for you. And also this, the facts speak for themselves, but you know, let, I'll, let me, I'll, let me tease it up. So you, you wrote your book. It started getting critical buzz right out of the gate, which of course was well-deserved and amazing. But then, I mean, it really just continued. The hits kept coming. So I know that the last year has been, I'm sure, equal parts gratifying and surreal at times. Yeah, definitely. So I think it helps a lot that this is my fifth career. So I've had full careers before now. I'm in my 50s now, so I have that good perspective. Um, and um, so my book, my hardcover launched um, on April uh, 16th of last year. So that was the same week as my 50th birthday. Um, so it's been really, really fun. And my paperback came out 
um, this past April as well. And um, it's been since um, last summer when I was at uh, in Win Winchester with you physically, which was so yeah. fun um, for your inaugural uh, summer festival. Um, let's see, we've had all of the sort of, you know, end of year best of the list come out, which was really gratifying and really wonderful. And I think the most fun thing about that was that um, my book was like one of the, uh, picked as one of the 10 best books of 2019 by Hudson Bookseller. So, and it was announced right at, in December. So when people were traveling in December, you know, to go see family and whatever, um, a lot of friends and fans would um, snap pictures of my book in this really gorgeous display with other books that are amazing that I love. And so they would text them to me. So that was really, really fun. I love that. I woke up on December 31st to Teo Brecht, who is one of my literary idols, um, talking about my book on the Today Show. So that was like a complete amazing thing. Um, and that was a complete surprise too. So I didn't even realize that she had read it. So that was fun. And then lots and lots of, um, you know, really fun lists and, uh, and festivals. Um, I went to this really amazing uh, festival in Savannah. Um, it was the February 14th, so Valentine's Day weekend. And the cool thing about this was that I went to this high school that was reading my book as uh, Miracle Creek as a high school thing, uh, the entire high school. And um, the English department put on this. So for those of you who don't know, uh, Miracle Creek is a courtroom drama. And it is um, a murder, it's based on a murder trial, four day murder trial of a young single mother who's been accused of murdering her eight year old son who's on the autism spectrum. And so this um, English department put together a mock trial of Miracle Creek. And so when I walked in, they had their teachers, like their English AP teachers who were playing you know, a judge, one was wearing like an actual judge's robe and, you know, with a gavel and there was, you know, courtroom attendants and jury box and people being sworn in and swearing, you know, being sworn in and um, asking questions and things like that. So it was just really, really an amazing experience. So things like that have, that have been just completely amazing have happened. Um, and then the paperback has been wonderful. And then now um, all the uh, foreign um, editions are starting to come out. So it came out in Germany um, and um, was a bestseller there. Um, so that, that was really gratifying as well, seeing all of the German stuff pop up and, um, and all of the reviews and sort of using Google Translate to translate those. And um, it, the translation is in the works for Korea right now and a lot of the other Asian countries. So that's really something that I'm looking forward to. So yeah, so those are some of the big, big highlights that I'm really excited about. So let me ask you this, because of course this is an unavoidable topic. I, I know that you had already done a considerable amount of touring starting last summer, but I, I can imagine that like everyone else, but, but maybe you more than others, um, this disruption of COVID you know, putting the kibosh on all travel and, and a personal events. How did that impact the tail end of the tour or were you pretty much off the road at that point or? No, so um, my paperback was coming out on, it came out on April 7th, I think it was, or 6th mm -hmm. or something like that. And so, um, so there was a whole tour that was, you know, all over uh, East Coast, West Coast, everywhere, sort of, all throughout March through really like October. And so that got completely canceled, of course. But the great thing is, is that we were able to move a lot of that online. And, um, and then uh, my wonderful team at Picador, which is my paperback publisher that's associated mm -hmm. with FSG, um, has now sort of gotten like basically weekly or actually in April, I think I had an event like every day. Um, over Zoom and Crowdcast and things like that. And what's been wonderful about that is that it's these tiny indie bookstores all over the country yeah. that I have been able to just have these really wonderful heartfelt discussions with. So now I feel like I'm really connected in to those communities and 
And then a lot of them have invited me back for book clubs with their, you know, with the people who bought books, like, you know, when I was doing the initial um, uh, Zoom and things like that. So it's actually been a really wonderful way to, from the comfort of my own home, yeah. really, you know, sort of feel connected into all of these communities that I otherwise might not have been able to visit. Because I think a lot of my um, scheduled tour stuff were big literary festivals and things like that. So I really, in some ways, um, from that perspective, it's been good. I mean, obviously, from my family's perspective and from a personal perspective, it's just, you know, it's not been um, anything good. But um, but I've had things like that to sort of look forward to. And then um, I feel like a lot of the book clubs, I love doing book club visits, like through Skype and Zoom and things. And so now Zoom yeah. book clubs are like, you know, very normal and everybody does it. So I've done so many of those. So it's been really fun. That's great. And, and isn't, it, isn't it fascinating, Angie? I mean, I feel like, you know, maybe in March, April, even May, those of us that were trying to be optimistic were looking at Zoom as kind of this, at worst, stopgap measure until we're back on our feet, and at best, kind of a silver lining of, well, you know, we can still connect. But what I'm seeing happening, and we've talked about it a lot throughout this weekend, is the fact that we're seeing a lot of the, the, the ostensible negatives of travel and expense and the opportunity to genuinely connect with a wider audience um, Zoom and, and just online virtual kind of meetings have really taken those barriers away. So, so I, my, I've become very bullish on, I think going forward at worst, we're going to be looking at hybrid models of, oh, exactly. I, I think book tours, music. Uh, you know, I had a conversation with a musician the other night and he was talking about how they're really feeling liberated. Cause I mean, you can imagine, right. Lugging gear and people want to go out on a weeknight to go see a concert. Right. Like it's been very liberating. And I just, it's a, it's fascinating to me that four months ago, I think if you would talk to any of us and said, you guys are actually going to be pretty giddy about this. We would have said, what are you nuts? This is a travesty. It's a disaster, but it really hasn't been in a lot of ways. I mean, so I've had some stuff happen personally with my family, with my extended family. My uncle passed away after, um, you know, a, a, a week long stint in the hospital on, you know, on a ventilator and things like that. So I, I, so I've, I've been sort of depressed from a personal perspective and then, you know, and then I, and then even like my kids, um, I feel so bad, badly for them. So my oldest is, um, and you've met all of them. My yeah. oldest is, um, going to college, you know, so he just had his high school graduation virtually which was, eh, and, yeah. um, and then my, you know, my second one, Steve, who did the music program with me and, and you and Winchester at the library. Right. Um, unfortunately, he is now a rising senior. So he's having to deal with like, you know, like the ACT and um, things like that. <laughs> and so it, it's, it's been weird, but definitely I, I think that people have really done a good job making the most out of it. I also am really, really excited that readers have been so supportive of independent bookstores. Don't you think, don't, don't you feel like you're seeing that? Like that people are really going out of their way to try to shop at these small businesses and the local indie stores. I've actually gone into a couple and like masked, fully masked and with gloves on, done signings and things like that. And it's been, um, it, I think it's really just like sort of bringing people together and, you know, brainstorming on how we can sort of still be together as a community, which is so nice to see. Yeah. And, and, and I'm, I'm glad you, I'm, I'm actually glad you set me straight. I don't want to, I don't want to sound too wide eyed and, you know, overly ebullient about what we, we, we've also talked this weekend quite a bit about. It's been a very heavy time, but I think what we've all, I think what a lot of us agree is, you know, we, we always need, art and the solidarity of community and 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 frankly distraction which you know art of all different types can provide that but it, particularly within these communities i think a lot of us um and we had a covid panel last night from the covid anthology uh, alone together where writers are talking about i'm already alone all the time you know yeah. I, I know the prospect of being alone for months without end yeah. uh, intimidating. So there, there's been a resilience, I think, within the artistic community that's been really powerful to watch. But, but your point is well taken that 2020 has been a very difficult year. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, you know, there, there's, I guess, ultimately two choices, right? I mean, I think, um, you know, you have to adapt to what's going on. And, and I just, I think that if you would predict it and, you know, I, I actually feel fortunate that the festival, we, we had enough time back in March to really get a clear eyed appraisal of what we were likely looking at. And we were able to shift. I mean, my heart went out to um, like Virginia Festival of the Book and, and certain events that had been planned all year and were ready to go live in March. Um, I, I don't want to overlook and I want to send a shout out of solidarity to people that really struggled. But to your point, I, I do think we've rallied around independent bookstores and, and there has been this kind of sense of community. But how amazing, right? Like you really were getting comfortable and, and very savvy on your tour meeting people What's it been like, you know, taking this to a virtual? I mean, I, I imagine, you know, there are some drawbacks, but I, you already articulated. There's a lot of, like, kind of unforeseen positives. Yeah, no, I, I really, I, I've become a huge fan of this hybrid model um, or, you know, in the future. I really think that even if we go back to physical bookstores and, you know, tours and things like that for author tours, um, let's say like two, three years down the line for my next book, let's, let's uh, you know, knock on wood that it actually yep. gets done. Um, but in any case, when that happens, I am definitely going to suggest that they do a Zoom for the people who couldn't come out. Because one thing that's been really wonderful is, especially for the people with like little kids at home who couldn't really come out, you know, like for bookstore evening events at seven, eight, whatever, being able to actually join in Zoom, even if it's only for like 10, 15 minutes, just to say a quick comment or, you know, just see what the author sounds like, you know, talking about their book or just asking a quick chat question. With whatever it is, it just allows that flexibility. And um, so I've become a huge fan of doing that as well. Um, having said that, I'm a huge extrovert, as you know, and so I really don't think that there's any a substitute for, you know, actually getting together and seeing people, and, you know, and, and the other thing that's been said is, like, you know, signing books and all of that sort of stuff. Sure, sure. Um, but um, on the art thing, um, this is sort of fun. Um, I'll get to um, talk about my son, the one that I was all, with all day today on the ACT thing. So he, he, you know, as you know, he's a musician, he's a composer, yep. and his music was um, featured in my audio book uh, by Macmillan Audio. And so what he did is he has a group of, I think it's like 45 kids now that he's now brought together. And they're called Quarantine Music Busters, QMB, and it's uh, qmusicbusters.com. And they um, do free virtual uh, music concerts for anyone and they've been really targeting a lot of senior centers especially and he actually got the idea from you Sean <laughs> because you actually get to take credit for this because remember when uh, we were at Winchester in yep. March with at, at Amar it was yes. Ed, and it was Sarah and um, and and um, Steve was my yes my musician who accompanied my reading and what was cool was there were some people who came out and who invited me and Steve to come to the nursing home that's in, uh, like, not a nursing home, it's a retirement community in um, Winchester. And it sort of gave him the idea that, hey, maybe the music could actually help to, you know, break up the loneliness, especially because this is an isolated group that you know, has been, especially in the retirement homes, they're really being quarantined a lot more strictly than the rest of us. Sure. And yeah. so he's actually been doing that. And I can't believe how much um, they've been doing as far as, you know, coming together. And they have like, you know, some of the best high school musicians in Virginia all amassed together. And they come and they like, you know, they do... Um, rehearsals at my house all masked and I'm so proud oh of them. Gosh. So, yeah, so they're really wonderful. So and if anybody has any um, requests for things like that, they just did a concert the other day for little kids who are really into classical music. And so um, just just text me or, you know, or just uh, somehow get in touch with me just um, at angiekimbooks.gmail.com and I'll forward it on to my desk. 
that that makes me so happy to hear that. Um, first of all, it doesn't. I mean, what a what a wonderful gesture. Uh, and knowing his parents, that doesn't surprise me that your son's doing that. But that's that's kind of what I'm talking about. And again, I mean, of course, this weekend we're we're trying to genuinely celebrate artists and and creatives and and building community. But there's just a great example beyond all this other stuff of ways in which. Um, you know, we, we really are hungry for that human touch and, you know, certainly physically, but there are ways around that. And I think what, what I'm taking from all these conversations I'm having is that, you know, it, it does take a little ingenuity, but I think what we're also discovering, and I mentioned this in another conversation, but it really hit me hard having come from the corporate world and, and not being, you know, unfamiliar with webinars and, and Google Live and, and all that. I still think even for me four months ago, and I think for the broader artistic community, we just kind of accepted that, well, webinars and stuff, that's business. You know, we artists don't use that. And I just think like the blinders have fallen off and people have really leaned into uh, the possibility. Understanding, because you, you put it well, you, you can't and shouldn't try to approximate the human connection. I think that that will come back. I, we have to believe that that will happen, but, um, you know, we took advantage of the technology and it's yeah. helped It's helped artists and audiences, which is great. But I think you also, I want to emphasize a point you make because it's come up repeatedly. It has really enabled artists to connect with people that even if COVID wasn't happening, your, your point is so well taken, like a house mother or someone that had to work late that night or just couldn't get out of the house. Like yeah. it's affording people that we didn't, we didn't used to think about a book signing not being in person. Uh, now a book reading can be online. Definitely. And um, and for those of you who are writers in the audience, I really would love to hear how everybody's doing on the creative process. Um, I don't know how you're doing, Sean, um, with your own writing and things like that. Um, I know for me, I was sort of severely just not even able to read, let alone write, but like, you know, all of March, let's say April, but lately, I found some ways to use this whole technology and isolation to actually get my butt in gear. Um, so mm -hmm. I start. Um, I joined with some friends um, who, and actually, one of them was Julia Phillips, who was oh. who was um, with me, you know, at our event last That's year. Right. That's right. That's right. So I'm so excited. So I'm happy to report back that she has had her baby. Um, yeah, a baby boy, and so she, she is taking well deserved time off to be with him Good. right now. Um, so she says hi and she sends her regards and her love. So I just want to say, say, Mwah, Julia. From Julia. Um, and um, anyway, so she before she had her baby, she was part of this as well. But what okay. um, a bunch of us are doing, um is every day at like 10 o'clock we get together on Zoom um, and we, we start a silent Zoom writing thing. And so we get together and we chat for a little bit, but then we like get to work and we all leave the Zoom on, but we all mute ourselves and then we write. And so it's just become this habit that you build and I have to say, before I had this, I wasn't able to write at all. I wasn't being productive. I wasn't even able to write. I was rereading like Severance over and over again, which is like a dystopian, you know, thing. Oh, which yeah. is a wonderful thing to reread over and over again. I highly recommend to everybody reading about Severance. But at the same time, I just don't think that that was like good from a product perspective and um and doing the silent zoom thing is just really did wonder so i really highly recommend that so first of all congratulations secondly yeah. my i that my mind is blown i haven't heard anyone that's doing that yeah now that you describe it i get it but talk a little bit first of all whose idea was it how did that evolve and secondly what is it about it that is it that kind of i, I think it's a very positive pressure but there is that you're on camera, you've got to produce. Talk us through like what it's like. So, um, so I, I think it was the brainchild of Jamie Mason. 
uh, who who is one of my favorite favorite writers. She is just has um, she has a wonderful book yet. Her latest book is called The Hidden Things, which was out last year. And I talked with her at one more page um, in person, one of the last you know in person things that we were able to do. Um, and Jay Shepard, um, who is a former lawyer turned novelist as well, and they're really, really good friends, and they came up with this idea, and they asked me to join in, and, um, and so, I, so I did, and I have to tell you, it, what the magic of this is, it's sort of like going to um, Starbucks or to the library, which is a Starbucks thing never really worked for me or any mm -hmm. coffee shop because I need like complete quiet in order to write. I'm just a very auditory person. So any kind of noise just distracts me and I can't, I can't do it. But um, I love going to the library to like the quiet room in the library to work because then you have the pressure of like, yeah, you're in public and nobody knows you and you don't know anyone, so it doesn't really matter. But still, the fact that you are sort of there to work, it's sort of like being in the office, you know, for writers. Yeah. Um, it's that feel. Um, and so, uh, so you have to do something. So you can't just like play around on your phone the entire time because you're right. like, what am I doing, you know? Mm. And so it's the same concept, except that you're doing it from, you know, your home. So we're on Zoom. And so usually I have the Zoom on the same computer as what I'm writing on. So I can just switch over. So if, if at any point I want to see like, hmm, I wonder what anybody else is doing, I can switch over and I can see the gallery view of everybody sort of like working or you know, um, maybe one person's gotten up to go get coffee or whatever, but you know, you can see that everybody's working and it's sort of like you see a little bit on it. Yeah, you can get away with like doing stuff on your phone, but you know, like you feel like, why? Um, so, so it's really, and, and it's more than anything else, it's the habit. It's like the, you know, you come there and, you know, pen, whatever, and you, know, you talk for a little bit and then you just get going. And it's like going into the office, you know? And, um, yeah. and I consider that time like of us chatting as almost like a commute in, you know? Sometimes it takes a little sure. longer and whatever, but um, it's just sort of transitioning you into that mind space. And then once you're working, you're working and it just sort of, you get acclimated and you get, you know, you build the habit yeah. um, and the expectation that I'm going to get work done today. And so to, this has become such an important thing to my, you know, um, COVID-19 life um, and to writing. And so I'm really, really excited about it. And I think I'm going to keep this up even after we're back. And, you know, even after we're, you know, even if I'm on tour, I can see myself being like, okay, I'm in a weird hotel. I'm just going to figure out the Wi-Fi so that I can get on Zoom and do this at 10 o'clock every day. You know, that, that's so fascinating on so many levels. And I'm glad, I, I hope every uh, writer or aspiring writer that's listening is taking notes because I think, you know, there's a lot of takeaways from that. But one of the key takeaways for me would be, you know, I, I think like most writers over the years, I've obsessively read about writing and writers writing about writing. And, you know, yeah. so there, there, are, there, are the, there are the handful, right, that are either geniuses or freaks that they're just like, ah, I write when I'm inspired and it all flows out. But for the most part, people need routines and people, you know, need to treat it almost like, or not even almost exactly like a physical training for a marathon where you're putting in the time every day, you've got to put in those hours uh, and there's a lot of drudgery and you don't write well. In fact, that's the secret. You write terribly to get through to that. Um, but I think that's an important takeaway for anyone that's listening that, um, Everybody I talk to over and over, and it, this, this, this does include musicians and, and even actors, the idea of you've got to put in the time and you've got to, you've got to get started in order to finish, right? It sounds <laughs> like so fake sweet. then, but if you don't start, nothing good is going to come of it. And you have to start and you have to just sort of trust the process too. Is, you know, you have to sort of um, trust that, yeah. And, and I think it's especially good for me because... Um, you know, I'm a, Miracle Creek was my debut novel. It's the first novel I've even attempted to write. So 
um, I, I was actually talking to um, Susan Choi, um, who wrote Trust Exercise, which is a book that I love and this year's um, National Book Award winner. And we were doing one of these um, bookstore events for Literati Bookstore, uh, which is in Michigan. And what we were talking about, which I find fascinating, is she was saying how Trust Exercise came out of an almost like a free writing exercise in hers where she um, was working on something else. And this was sort of her um, way of venting when that other thing that she was really working on was not going well. Okay. She was like, you know, oh, I'll just play around a little bit with this fun story that I don't think is going to go anywhere. And that became trust exercise. And similarly for me, I found when I was, um, I've been archived, I archived everything from related to Neil Fulcrum to get it out of my system and get it out of, you know, sort of my, out of my writing nook symbolically so that I could sort of start working on my next novel. And um, so I put everything into files and boxes and whatever. And as I was, and I archived my um, uh, files, like electronic files. And as I was doing that, one thing that I found um, that I started in 2012, it, which is so fascinating to me, and I told her about it, and we were just laughing about it, is that I found this Word document where I, it was titled, um, in all caps, this is not a novel. And I was telling myself, this miracle creek is not a novel. This is, you know, my first attempt at a novel. It's a practice. It's exercise you know it's just because i heard so many people say well my first novel it you know i wrote it and it was horrible so i put it away in a drawer somewhere so i sort of thought this is going to be bad so i felt fine having you know seven pov characters because i was like whatever it's not a real novel i'm just having fun with the voices and i'm having fun with figuring out plot and I was using this almost like an exercise to figure out what a novel is supposed to be rather than actually trying to write a novel. And I think that there's a lesson there because I think that that freedom gave me the, the not the right, but like the, just the freedom to be able to experiment and sort of say to myself, you can do whatever you want and not worry about it because it's not never going to see the light of day. It's not an actual work that you're going to try to get published because it's going to suck. And so I think that there's something great about that. And uh, the thing that I have to wrap my head around now is that now that I do have one novel, you know, and I have an agent and all of that sort of stuff is that I have to sort of somehow convince myself that this next novel that I'm working on that to allow myself the freedom to experiment and to sort of write without that fear um, of what it might or might not become. So, you know, it's, it's interesting to sort of be here. Well, you know, that reminds me, Angie, I've, what, speaking of reading about writing, I, I have found it, it's, it's like this great conundrum. It's, it's simultaneously super inspiring and super terrifying when I read writers that have written at the highest levels and, you know, won awards and have done it for decades. And they'll say things along the lines of, every time I start a new novel, I, I don't think I can do it or I, I forget how. I'm like, what do you mean you forget how? And it's like, well, there isn't really, I mean, I think for certain genre, right? You know, there's obviously a certain formula you follow, but even a genre book, you've, there's no, I don't think there's any writer that's ever written a book where I started with, it was a dark and stormy night and finished with the end. There's a circuitous process, but there are days when I find that inspiring, like, well, if Philip Roth struggled, I'm fine. But then I terrify and say, God, it's never going to get any easier. But I appreciate that you're actually trying, you know, some different strategies to liberate your, your kind of subconscious and, and have fun with it. I mean, you're saying some things today that are really important and inspiring, frankly, for me, because I think that that's a really overlooked, you know, we, we can and should beat into the ground. Like you got to work, you know, it's going to take time. Your first efforts might not be successful, but gosh, to have fun with it and to allow yourself to experiment and fail. Uh, how did you, how did one attain such wisdom, Angie? <laughs> right. Well, because I'm old. Um, but, <laughs> and I've gone through five careers. So that's, that's not a lot. 
No, um, but I, I, I do think that it's really, really hard. And it's hard to um, keep that in mind. And, and also to, and, and I think the, the thing that's hard for me and why it's so valuable to sort of force myself to sit in that chair every day is, is this idea that, you know, with Miracle Creek, I have a finished product. And so I'm comparing my efforts now on the second novel with something that's finished. And it's not really fair to myself because, right. you know, it's, I, I, obviously I don't know what I'm doing. I have no idea what it was. I don't, I, I don't know these characters as well. I don't know the story. I don't know the shape that it's gonna be. Mm -hmm. And even though I tell myself, yeah, I went through that with Miracle Creek too and it turned out okay. Right. Um, it's hard to believe at times. And so I am doing this thing right now. My, my silent Zoom people, our uh, writer friends are all laughing at me because they'll be like, so what are you doing today? And I'll be like, you know, I'm reading a how-to book on how to write a novel because I don't remember anymore. And, you know, I'm trying to like get to know these characters. And uh, it's, it's a, it, I, so I know a lot about how to write, you know, novels because I've read all of them in the last month or so, so. Well, that's a, you know, but that's an interesting point. Like, are you seeing some uh, contradictory things or are there certain themes that are emerging from what you're reading of what to avoid and what to, you know, in my experience is kind of all over the place. And again, I find that equally refreshing and frustrating, but right. I haven't so, found any formulas that are really consistent. Yeah, not formulas, but just the processes. I think yeah. it's just the processes that you have to sort of like go back to. And a lot of them are just sort of structure points and things like that. And um, so, yeah, it, it, it's been really interesting because I um, find myself gravitating to the books that I, that I found really helpful when I was writing Miracle Creek. And I just forgotten a lot of the things that they said. But now that I'm reading them, I'm like, oh, yeah, I did see that. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's, that's how I structure the book. And so it's interesting to sort of see that um, at work. And um, I'm reading a lot of books right now and, um, you know, and sort of trying to sort of uh, learn from them, which is something that I did a lot at, for Miracle Creek as well. So, you know, these are the things that I'm sometimes, I feel like I'm sort of going back to the drawing board a little bit, but yeah. I'm not sort of taking anything for granted. And um, yeah, so it's, it's interesting. And it's also because I'm, I'm not really going back to the same genre. This next one is not gonna be a court and drama. Okay. Um, it's not, it, there's a little bit of suspense. I think all good books, no matter what genre has suspense in them, but um, I, it's not, it's, gonna be, it's, a, it's a different genre than, the, than Miracle Creek. So, um, and I really admire um, authors like, you know, like say Kate Atkinson or people like that who do the different genres. But um, I do think that it's a little more um, challenging because the readers expect different things and you have to sort of like think about what they expect so, sure. Yeah. So it's really interesting. So I'm curious. Did you did you have your idea for the second book while you were writing Miracle Creek, or after, or how did that? How long has that been kind of germinating in your head? Um, it's been germinating for a really long time. So mm -hmm. this next novel is actually based on probably my favorite thing I've ever written, um, which is a short story that is that was published in the Sycamore Review and. Um, one uh, fiction contest that was judged by Charles Baxter, who is one of my literary idols. So, yeah. um, so it's one of my favorites, and it's the same characters except like a, like three four years later, and it's a slightly different event, but um, with some some of the same themes. And so yeah. it's been brewing in my mind for a really long time, and in a way, it's sort of a companion piece. To Miracle Creek. So Miracle Creek, for those of you who don't know um, about it, it's um, focusing really on, I think, uh, parents, parenting sacrifices, like parents, immigrant parents, parents of special needs kids and kids with uh, chronic medical illnesses. 
and so the isolation that they feel and the need for connection that they have and things like that. And a lot of the, most of the POV, the point of view characters are parents and they are speaking from that perspective. And this one is sort of a similar kind of, kinds of um, sets of people, even though they're not the same characters per se, but um, you know, they're in similar situations and but they're the siblings and the children um you know who are mm -hmm. sort of speaking and less the yeah. parents and sort of so it's in a way it's the companion piece and we will see some of the same uh, characters over again in an overlapping way but in a much more peripheral way so um so it's been really interesting to sort of think about that from that perspective and sort of um switch my mindset a little bit that sense. So we just need you to finish it before our next lift fest. Can you handle that? I don't. I don't think I'm going to. No pressure. You got a year. <laughs> you got a year. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah definitely not. Um, so speaking of Miracle Creek, we have a question, and yeah. I, I we we've got plenty of time. We don't have a ton of time, so I want to make sure I acknowledge uh, Amy's question. Amy asks, um, wondering if Angie knew the ending of Miracle Creek ahead of time, or if that was ever a source of anxiety at all to figure it out? Oh, completely a source of anxiety. So I did not. Um, I knew enough to know that there would be a resolution. Um, so like if you look at my one page outline that I had when I started writing. Um, so I probably did about six months of pre-writing, exploring characters and things like that. And then actually started drafting. And, um, and in about a year into the process, I still didn't know who set the fire, which is the inciting incident that starts off the novel. And so I was definitely stressed about it, but not too stressed because remember, it, this was not a novel, you know, and this is where it helped me. So I did not know what, who had set the fire. I didn't know what the ending was going to be, but I was okay with starting to write like not knowing that because I didn't think it was actually going to be a novel. And so um, this is what I'm, so I'm right now at this point with my second novel where I'm just like, I, I have no idea what the ending is. So the beginning of my second novel that I'm working on right now is called A Happiness Potion. And it's about a, a, a preteen boy who's nonverbal um, with autism and apraxia. And he goes on a walk at the beginning of the novel with his father, who's the primary caregiver and only the boy returns home. And because he's nonverbal, he can't tell, you know, the, the family or the authorities what happens on the walk with the, with the father. I have no idea what happened to the dad. I, I don't know. I really like him. I like the family. I don't want him to suffer. I hope he's not dead. I have no idea. And this is sort of the same as it was with Miracle Creek. I did not know who set the fire. I didn't know if it was accidental. I didn't know if it was like a conspiracy or I just didn't know. And it really didn't bother me that much to start writing because again, I sort of thought these are just writing exercises that I'm doing. Who cares if I don't know? If I never know, it'll be fine. Um, well, in this book, I sort of feel like, huh, I should really figure this out. Like I thought I am really, it's really making me very anxious at night and I can't sleep that I don't know what's happened to the father. Um, and, but I, at the beginning of the, right, the drafting process for Miracle Creek, this is what I had for the ending in my one page out, very skeletal outline that I had, which was by the end, we will find out who set the fire or what happened to cause the fire. Like I knew that we would find out. Yeah. Whereas with this one, I'm not actually sure that we're gonna ever find out. Wow, wow. Well, and you know, what you're talking about though, right, is again, is, a, is an object lesson for, for, for any writer. And it's, it's reminding me, right? Um, it's speaking of writers who are insanely prolific and, and, and he's probably one of the examples of, or the exceptions that I referred to earlier, Someone like Stephen King, who I love reading him say, because there's no real arrogance in it. He just says, I start typing and I figure it out as I go. And I just think for some, for mere mortals, that sounds so intimidating or even pretentious. But I think you're proving that 
part of it is you got to get the work done. You've got to get to work so something can happen. But then you, that that's part of the mystery of writing is that you fall in love with the characters and you understand things that maybe you didn't even understand at the beginning. And so there, there, it, it, it is not a prescriptive. And I, I mistakenly used the word formula earlier. There's absolutely no formula because right. for it to be real, for it to be truthful, I think there has to be that element of mystery. And that certainly comes across in Miracle Creek, but um, I've read other authors say that enough where even as a writer and an avid reader, there's, there's a little bit of anxiety that I feel hearing that, right? Because yeah. I want to know what the answer is. Yeah, and, and, and this is where I revert back to the process and you have to trust the process and you have to trust that you're gonna, like it's gonna come to you. You're, it's, you know, and if it doesn't come to you, then maybe that's the point. You know, uh, one of my favorite novels is uh, Tim O'Brien's In the Lake of the Woods, which is a mystery about a missing person. Uh, wife goes missing at the beginning of the novel, and we never find out. But that is really the point. Like, the point, he has many, I think he has like 150 footnotes throughout the novel. Yeah. It's a very slim novel. Yep. And, um, but a lot of the footnotes are actually from the um, the narrator, whoever the, um, the narrator is, who's like the researcher. I don't know if it's actually meant to be Tim O'Brien or somebody else who's, you know, like the fictional character who's writing this novel. Regardless of who it is, he really sort of goes on and on pontificating about sort of the nature of mystery and, you know, are we ever meant to know some of these things? Like, how, will, how can we know these? It's like if somebody disappears and we don't know what happened to them, like who knows what happened to them except the person who did disappear. And maybe they didn't even know because maybe they were just drugs or whatever. You know, so there's just so much. And, and um, so I think that's really an interesting thing to sort of ponder. And, um, and that's why we have to sort of come back to the process of you have to just trust the process. And you have to just sit your ass down in your seat like every day. And you have to just trust that every day you will get to know each other, you know, the characters little by little. You will have days when you think, wow, I just, I, I had an epiphany. Like I just, I now know something that I didn't know about my story, about my characters or whatever. But then like the next day you'll come back and you'll go, when I thought I knew yesterday, that's bullshit. It's just so bad. It's awful. And it's just so trite or whatever it is. And so it is going to be this roller coaster process. But you have to trust that, like, even if it is a roller coaster, it gradually goes up, you know? Um, and at some point, you'll get there. There's um, Peter Heller, who wrote The River, which is a fabulous book that I loved last year. Um, I, I, he and I were at, um, in Augusta, Georgia together and, um, for a writing conference. And one thing that he said that he does, and I think this is actually really helpful for like every writer. Um, but I didn't really prescribe it, but he was like, please just try it. And then I guarantee that this will work. And I think that there's something to it, which is he sets a time or, you know, or word limit or whatever it is, some sort of objective goal on what he's going to get that done that, that, that day. So let's say that he says, okay, I'm going to start writing at nine, I'm going to stop at 11. When the alarm goes off, or let's say it's a word count, like 500 words or 1,000 yeah. words, and at 1,000, he sets his computer so that it dings or whatever. When it dings, it doesn't matter even if he's in the middle of a sentence even if he knows exactly what he wants to write for the rest of the paragraph, and he knows that he can knock out a brilliant paragraph that is in his mind, yeah. like the, you know, just by two more minutes, he just stops, which I think takes incredible willpower. So I'm not sure that I could do that when I feel like, oh, what if I forget it by tomorrow, you know? But yeah. he swears by this method that he just stops himself and he swears that by the time he comes back the next day, he will not only remember, but it will just really, like, it'll have gotten better and reached a new high. So, you know, I think I, I, I've certainly read a similar, I haven't heard something that unbelievable in terms of, of willpower um, and discipline. 
but I think Hemingway was a big proponent of at least when you've got like the next word, you know, that whatever the next word is going to be. And, and there's, I, I, I think that that certainly stands to reason. Like at least if I sit down tomorrow, I'm going to get one word written and it's, you know, I'm probably going to do more than that, but wow, the discipline of that. But it also conjures up uh, as any writer knows, there is so much mystery uh, and, and the things that come out of the subconscious and putting ideas to work uh, in the back of your head. Uh, I think we're ceaselessly amazed at stuff that comes out and we think that couldn't have come from me if it had to come from somewhere. But I, I, I really, that resonates because I, I, I don't think that that's hokey at all. I think, um, you know, uh, trusting that your own mind and what goes on back there yeah. is always working behind the scenes. Um, and that can yield some magical stuff. Wow. Well, so we probably got time for one more thought. Um, I wanted to just say, and I think this is a nice way to wrap up, like not only this conversation and, and our ongoing dialogue, but I just want to kind of briefly celebrate, you know, the, the reason that we got to know each other and meet was because of Ed. And, you know, give a shout out to Ed, um, Ed Amar. And, I've talked a lot this weekend. I've talked a lot, period, because I, I truly believe it's part of the 1455 mission. But this notion of community and, and really being invested and being invested in your own, taking your own life seriously, of course, but really wanting to lift others up and recognizing that with that attitude, good things happen, not just for others, but it invariably is a, is a reward to yourself. And I just want to acknowledge that you're very much a part of that before, during, and after the ascent of Miracle Creek. I, I'm curious, you know, for, for the folks checking in, um, you know, what your thoughts and your philosophy is as it, re as it relates to kind of the writing community and what our responsibilities are and our roles in terms of not just taking care of our own work, which is a lifetime, but, you know, also paying it forward. I think it's just, uh, it's, it's, it's so important. I think it's um, not only because of the expectation um, it sounds horribly selfish that, you know, if you're nice to other people, then they'll be nice to you and blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. um, but although that does, I think, happen, and I think that's, in a way, it's not really selfish because I think it is just sort of um, knitting a community together and, you know, making it tighter. Um, so I do think that it's great for the community as a whole. But also because I think reading other people's work, for me anyway, is an inspiration. And it's the way that I find uh, motivation to write my next sentence and my next paragraph. And I think that that's, um, so I have really no choice but to read new work. And, and when I, find something that moves me, I just, I, I, maybe it's just because I'm an extroverted person, I can't help but want to celebrate it with other people. And I think that's just so important in knowing how fragile we are as writers and, you know, and how much we need that encouragement to go on, at least for yeah. myself. Um, you know, so the thought that I might be doing that to somebody whose work I loved anyway and wanted to celebrate anyway, like that's just like the icing on the top, you know? For sure. And you know, I the 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 elevator pitch for the 1455 mission, right, is celebrating creativity and building community. Um, I wanna thank you, Angie, for for being you, for for being such an inspiration. But I think if there's anyone in this past year to bring this all full circle that really embodies what I would say is, is the prototype of the 1455 inspiration in terms of celebrating creativity, building and supporting and nurturing community, it's you. So on behalf of all of these readers and writers, thank you for, for all the work you do. And I'm so excited for seeing where this, the journey continues to go for you. And we will talk again next year because now you're just gonna be a regular at this level. Oh, definitely, of course. I would, I'm gonna be completely offended if you don't you know keep on inviting me over and over and over again you're in, it's like the mafia you're in for life exactly so please know that and um and we have to do a toast to ed amar who brought us together right indeed indeed Woo! Yay. okay <laughs> shout out to ed angie thank you so much uh take care be well say hi to the family 
and uh, we'll talk soon. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Everybody, we're going to roll right into the keynote in a couple of minutes, so thanks for being here. Uh, we're going to check in with Beth Ann and Adrian momentarily. Angie, take care, and we'll see everybody soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye.